great to welcome to the program today, David Scheimer, who's a fellow at Yale University and also author of the book Rigged America, Russia and 100 Years of Covert Electoral Interference. Uh, David, the title already tells us uh, a, a lot about uh, my, my first question, but um, in the in the discussion about alleged Russian interference in the 2016 election and planned interference in 2020, there's this bigger discussion of how long has transnational election interference been going on. So so maybe let's start there. Where, where how long has it been going on? Sure. So what I do in my book is I restore history to the subject of covert electoral interference because a myth that is prevalent in our discourse today is that Russian interference in the 2016 election um, was somehow new or novel or unprecedented. And, and that's dangerous because if something's treated as unprecedented, then it's treated as something that there's no history behind. And it's very easy to manipulate how people perceive it and whether people even believe it happened. And what I do in this book is show that in fact, for the last century, beginning in 1919, the Soviet Union for a period, the United States and the now Putin's Russia have been interfering in elections all over the world. I show where, I show why, I show how they have used their intelligence services to direct and disrupt open elections. And I then use that history to shine new light on what actually happened in 2016, how we can understand what Putin achieved and what we should be doing now to defend our elections, both before November and, and thereafter. So there's like five different branches that we could explore. Le I'll just pick one to start with. What would be since 1919 the most successful examples of that interference? Sure. So there's one case that that it was actually what sparked my interest in this whole subject, which was in 1972. Um, there was a vote of no confidence in the chancellor of West Germany, Willy Brandt. And this and this vote of no confidence came at a pivotal moment in the history of the Cold War. Willy Brandt had been executing a foreign policy of Ostpolitik. He had been reestablishing relations with the Soviet Union, with the Eastern Bloc, a real pivotal Cold War figure, which um, as a result of his groundbreaking policies sparked um, dissent within his parliamentary coalition. And there was a vote to remove him from office as chancellor. That vote failed by two votes, just two after which he was able to ratify the treaties he'd been pursuing and and, and really pursue um, to completion, um, or as he saw it, his foreign policy. And what I reveal in the book is that there was a covert operation executed by East German intelligence ordered by Moscow to purchase those two votes. And I interviewed one of the intelligence officers who participated in that operation. He now lives just outside of Berlin. I spent about half a day with him. I went through a bunch of different archives and recreated this story. And it's a story of targeting two vulnerable lawmakers who were very corruptible because of their womanizing, their debts, um, their alcoholism, turning them, drawing them in slowly, and then paying them each 50,000 Deutschmarks in exchange for their abstentions, and then covering it up. And it took decades for this operation to come out. Um, and had the East German intelligence um, agency not interfered in this vote, the outcome would have been different. Brandt would have fallen from power and the trajectory of the Cold War would have changed. Um, and it did not as a direct result of covert interference. Just briefly, do you know offhand how much 50,000 Deutschmarks then is roughly like how many dollars today would we be thinking about? Like a little less than $100,000. OK, so. Money, it's not a crazy amount. No, certainly given the, the 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 way in which it redirected the the trajectory of things at the time. Um, now, as a sort of disclaimer moment, you we are not arguing here that Russia is the only country that does this. We are just we happen to be talking about Russia, but that's a common defense that number one, other countries also do this. And number two, the U.S. also does this elsewhere. You're not denying either of those assertions. No, I'm denying I'm denying neither of those assertions, but I do make the argument in my book that the story of covert electoral interference is primarily to this point. This may change now moving forward, but to this point has primarily been a story of Moscow and Washington. So between 1919 and 1947, the Soviet Union was interfering in elections all over the world with brief interruptions and very intensely between 45 and 47 across Eastern Europe. Between 1948 and 1991, the CIA and the KGB were going toe to toe in elections all over the world in order to either seek to defeat 
um, or advance leftist candidates. And since 1991, Vladimir Putin's regime has rediscovered and enhanced the weapon of covert electoral interference using the internet. He is once again targeting elections all over the world in order to support authoritarian minded and divisive candidates. Um, and now one of the countries under attack in a real meaningful way is America itself. So this is a very old story and there are many lessons to draw from that story as we seek to understand our present moment. It is not accurate to say that it is just Russia that has been executing these sorts of operations, but we also shouldn't minimize the role of Moscow in this history because Moscow really has been the pioneer um, beginning with Vladimir Lenin in 1919 to the regime of Vladimir Putin today. So what was done in 2016? And I think maybe what would be useful would be to contextualize it in, you know, when you have an election that ultimately comes down to about 75,000 votes in three states and otherwise would have would have been a Hillary Clinton win. Uh, we have to balance what Russia did with James Comey opting to do a second presser about Hillary Clinton's emails with targeted social media campaigns, Hillary Clinton not going to Wisconsin, right? Like we can when it's so close. It's hard to say one thing was the difference maker, but that still means we should explore what exactly did Russia do. Exactly. And I think it's a real trap um, to fall into the question of effectiveness when it comes to operations to manipulate people, because there are two ways to manipulate an election, to alter actual ballots and to manipulate minds, public opinion. And as I said, I've scoured this history. I interviewed more than 130 people, eight former CIA directors, gone through archives across six countries. And what comes out of that history is that for operations to manipulate people, there's never a clear answer as to how many people were manipulated or how many people's minds were changed. It's about making informed analytical judgments and then orienting future policy based on those judgments. It's the first point. The second point as to what Russia did is Russia did three things. The first is Russia systemically manipulated social media platforms with, with propaganda in spreading propaganda that advanced its two objectives, to sow discord and division um, and to advantage one candidate over another, which by the way is nothing new. I spent about half a day with the former KGB general and they tried to do both of those things in many US elections during the Cold War. They just didn't have social media to do it. The, the second thing that Russia did was hack and release sensitive emails that were damaging to Hillary Clinton's candidacy. And the third thing that Russia did um, was systemically target our voting systems, which was actually what captivated the Obama administration in the summer and fall, because Russian military intelligence was scanning, probing, and penetrating our election infrastructure to the point where, according to folks like John Brennan, um, Russia had the ability to alter the vote tallies and voter data of U.S. citizens on election day itself. So there's people who will look at that and they'll say, you know, that's a lot of work for ultimately getting Donald Trump elected um, to the extent that it helped. And in the end, Donald Trump really hasn't done that much that seems great for Russia. And you'll have people provide lists on both sides. Here's things that Trump did that seem good for Russia. Here's things Trump did that seem not so good for me. It's never really been about that. It's been about listen, the, the U.S. now is a laughing stock in a way that it was not prior to 2016. The U.S. is not in conversations about climate change because Trump says it's a hoax created by the Chinese. The U.S. is increasing. I mean, on coronavirus, we're not leading. For me, it's not about getting specific concessions. It's about questioning how stable is the U.S. and how how clearly are people thinking. And, and it's a bigger picture thing where it's sort of the downfall of American democracy broadly more than about Trump doing things for Putin. Is that the right lens or is it a different lens we should be thinking of? No, you're spot on. I think a real misconception is that Putin got tr helped to get Trump elected. So therefore, Trump is going to cede Ukraine to Russia or something like that. And, and that kind of transactional view of why Trump is a value to Putin. And, and that really misunderstands Putin's foreign policy and his and his and his his strategy, really, which is in America to degrade, disrupt and discredit American democracy, to corrupt American democracy in itself. So when Trump causes chaos, 
when Trump sows discord, when Trump erodes democratic norms, that is the dream of Russia. The, the, that matters so much more than what might be happening regarding a specific foreign policy decision, because what Vladimir Putin wants is for American democracy to erode, for him to therefore be able to say to his own people, see, democracy doesn't work. Um, the story of American democracy was a myth, and you shouldn't want that. It opens up new opportunities for influence for him because as America retreats as a leader abroad, um, that means that states will therefore be more susceptible to Russian influence. Um, and it also makes it so that America is so divided at home, is so disrupted at home that America can't push back against Russia abroad and can't engage with Russia in a, in a meaningful way abroad. So. Trump could do nothing transactionally that helps Russia, and yet the Trump presidency can be of enormous value to Putin. And that is the best way to understand what Trump's presidency has thus far been. For example, what we see happening in Portland right now, you know, it's it, having soldiers or, or DHS officials who don't have marks on their uniforms, it's reminiscent of what Putin did in Ukraine with his soldiers being unmarked. And it also shows that America and Russia, you know, it enables this what about us sort of argument that that America should be seeking to rebut because there is no equivalency or should not be between Russian and American behavior domestically. When it comes to the other superpower of China, um, one of the allegations that has been made is that Donald Trump specifically asked the Chinese president for help when it comes to farmers. The idea being China buys stuff from American farmers. This helped Trump helps Trump with the farmers that helps him get reelected in 2020. That's like a really specific ask. More yeah. broadly, there's this interview from last year where Trump was interviewed by George Stephanopoulos and Stephanopoulos said if Russia or China came to you with information that was useful to you, would you call the FBI? Would you accept it? And Trump said, well, yeah, I would look at it first and then, you know, maybe I tell the FBI, maybe I wouldn't. Talk a little bit about either abstractly or concretely the role of China in the 2020 election. So I think that's a really open and interesting question because 2016 was a turning point in this history in a couple of ways, one of which was it was the first time the issue of covert electoral interference was really broadcast to the world. It exited the shadows and it showed China, Iran, North Korea, whomever you can really disrupt American democracy with not that much money um, and with relatively simple ideas because of how exposed our country is. So I think a question on my mind is whether China seeks to imitate and further the Russian model or whether this will continue to be a Russian tradition. I don't know the answer to that. I think we will know the answer in the coming months. But I think something that we should be clear eyed about is that to this point, this has been much more a Russian story than a Chinese story. So folks who say China will break new ground here, or North Korea or Iran, and it's as if everyone's operating from the same starting point, that's just not true. You know, Vladimir Putin worked for the KGB for 15 years. He was a part of an agency that was interfering in elections all over the world. There's a history here. There's a reason why Russia is at the forefront here. And I think we should keep that in mind. And a brief point on Trump. I also think Americans really need to keep in mind that regardless of what he says, this is not a political issue. If you believe in this threat, that doesn't make you, you know, a Democrat. The the Soviets targeted Ronald Reagan during the Cold War, a Republican. They targeted Richard Nixon, a Republican, to destroy their campaigns. Now they just so happen to be helping a Republican. But the point isn't to help a Republican. The point is to further the interests of the Russian state, which is to degrade, corrupt, and tear down American democracy. And that is not in alignment with the interests of any American citizen, regardless of political party. So to touch on 2020 and Russia, then, if you look at the polls now, they certainly don't look good for Donald Trump. But as I've been telling my audience, you, you have to assume nothing. You have to vote as if your vote is the deciding vote in your state. That's really the only the only intelligent way forward. But does does Russia's ability to meddle become diminished if indeed the election is not close or do their priorities change or how does that affect things? So their priorities change because another myth here is that Russian interference is just about getting Donald Trump elected. Again, not true. Russia's operation to interfere in the 2016 election started in 2014, before Trump even announced his candidacy. And as I reveal in my book, based on my interviews with John Brennan and Jim Clapper, Russia had plans to continue interfering in our politics to undermine Hillary Clinton had she won the election. Um, and they were basically starting that operation before Trump even won, which surprised Putin. So as we await Election Day now, it's important to keep in mind that the foremost Russian objective, again, is to undermine our democracy 
democracy to sow doubt about the functioning of our democracy. And yes, Trump might be losing, but new opportunities emerge, such as if Donald Trump is alleging that the election will be rigged. It is in Russia's interest for Americans to believe their election is rigged because right. that makes Americans no longer believe in their democracy. So Russia could, and this is hypothetical, but Russia did have this capability four years ago, you know, scramble voter registration databases, cause chaos at polling places anonymously to therefore provide fodder to those who would allege that the election was rigged for the Democratic side. So therefore, after the election, half the country might not actually believe in the outcome of the election, which would only sow further division and further discredit American democracy in the eyes of the world as well as its own people. So there are many ways to achieve the Russian objective. Donald Trump is a means to an end of that objective of undermining American democracy, but he's not the end in itself. And Americans should keep that in mind because this threat will not disappear regardless of whether Donald Trump loses because this is a long running Russian mission. The KGB has targeted American elections for decades. Russia has been interfering in our politics since before Trump came on the scene. And that story will continue in 2021 and beyond. The book is rigged America, Russia and 100 years of covert electoral interference. We've been speaking with the book's author, David Scheimer, a fellow at Yale University. I so appreciate your time today. Thank you very much.